Hey everybody, thanks again for joining us online and Merry Christmas. I know that this Christmas isn't like probably Christmases you've had in the past. Maybe the holidays are already a hard time for you. Maybe this holiday season is especially hard for a variety of reasons. But no matter how you feel, whether you're excited about Christmas, whether it's kind of a down time for you, no matter how you feel, I want you to know that during this time, I hope that you can have a very Merry Christmas, that you can find joy, that you can find peace, that you can find meaning, that you can find encouragement in what I'm about to share with you today. Now, if you didn't know, we're in part three and in our final week of a message series that we've been calling Bright Lights. And if you haven't seen all those messages, I want to encourage you that right here on our YouTube channel and also on our Facebook page, you can go ahead and you can watch those and catch up in the series if you haven't already. And in the first week, we talked about what it looked like for you to step into the light and how you move out of darkness into hiding your sin from God and others and moving into the light by confessing your sin to God and others so that you can be cleansed and forgiven. And then we looked at, since once you step into the light, you're meant to be a light. And last week, we looked at what it means for you to be a light in this dark world and what it looks like for you to love God and to love others and to serve others and to sacrifice for others and share Christ with others so that you can be a light in this dark world. Well, today, I want to talk to you about the true light. The true light. One of the things that Jamie and I love to do during the holiday season is we love to look at bright lights. In fact, we've done it twice in the last two weeks. Every Wednesday night, we have our date night. And for our last two date nights, the last two Wednesday nights, a portion of our date night, I'm not even kidding you, we finish eating, we finish you know, doing whatever we're doing at the house, washing the dishes, all that stuff. And when we finish that up, She goes, can I get a hot chocolate and can we go look at lights? And so that's what we've done the last few weeks. And it's really what we do every year. We like to look up different neighborhoods and different houses in the area that have bright lights. And we just love to drive around in the car with one another and talk with one another and connect with one another and just kind of look at all the different ways that different people decorate their houses. And we like to look at bright lights during those times. Now, here's the truth is everybody is looking for light. And I'm not talking about the lights that are found on a tree or on a house, but I'm talking about everybody's looking for light in the sense that they're looking for something in their life that will bring them joy. Everybody is looking for light in the sense that they're looking for meaning, they're looking for purpose, they're looking for love. Everybody is looking for light in their life. Now, some people, they look for light, by trying to look and try to find money. And so they try to get as much money as they can, thinking that that will be what brings light into their life. Other people, they look to relationships, and they look to relationships to be the light in their life. And for a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife or whatever, they try to get a relationship that will bring them light and bring them love in their life. Other people, they look to success. And they say, well, you know, how much can I achieve and how much can I do and how much can you know, I get people to think that I'm powerful? And they think once they get that, then they'll have light in their life. Some people, they look to sex. Some people, they look to a house. Some people, it's food. It's a drink. It's drugs. People look to all sorts of different things in this world to be a light in their life, to bring the love, meaning, purpose, and life in their life. But here's the truth is none of those things can bring you true light in your life because they're all false lights. In fact, there is only one true light in the world. There is only one person. There is only one place. There is only one source that can give you the love and that can give you the joy and that can give you the meaning and the purpose that you're so longing for in your soul. And that true light is Jesus. And so today we're going to be looking through John chapter 1 verses 6 to 14 and it talks to us and shows us how Jesus is the one and true light and how it really shows us the true meaning of Christmas. So let me read it to you. John chapter 1 verses 6 to 14. It says, There was a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. 
He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, from that passage today, I want to show you three parts, three points about what it means for Jesus to be the true light of the world. Here's the first point I want to share with you on what it means for Jesus to be the true light. It's this, is that the true light came into the world full of grace and truth. The true light of the world came into this world full of grace and truth. I want to read to you verse 9, and then we're going to skip, and I want to read verse 14 to you in John chapter 1. Verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And then verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and in truth. So verse 9 starts out and it says that the true light, so there's all these false lights in the world, there are all these things that say they're light, that appear to be light, but they're not truly light, but here's the true light that came from heaven to earth and he came, why? To give light to everyone. But what does that mean? What does that mean for him to be a true light? What does it mean that the true light came into the world when Jesus was born as a baby in Bethlehem, placed in a manger? What does that mean for him to be true light? Well, verse 14 says that he came into the world from the Father, full of grace and truth. So he came into the world as the true light because he came into the world as somebody filled full of both grace and truth. He didn't just come into the world with just grace. He didn't just come into the world with just truth, but with grace and truth together. We live in a world of, rather than truth, we live in a world with lies. Rather than in a world filled with graciousness, we live in a world with hate, division, people that are constantly at one another's throats. Jesus comes into the darkness of our lives. Jesus, thousands of years ago when he entered human history, came into that dark world. He wants to come into your dark world today as the true light, which means he comes in full of grace and truth. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's start with the first word, truth. What is the truth that Jesus comes to tell us? Here's the truth. It's really two parts. Number one, you're made in the image of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. That God created you because He loves you. God created you to have a relationship with Him. God created you uniquely amongst all the creation of the world. When you compare human beings to animals, when you compare human beings to rocks, to water, we are different. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. But although we are made in the image of God, we're deeply flawed. Although we're made in the image of God, we've all fallen short of God's perfect standard for our lives. We've all sinned. We've all rebelled against God's perfect law. And ultimately, sin at its root is rebellion against God. And when we rebel against God because we want to be God of our own lives, we don't want Him to be God in our lives, ultimately what that rebellion does is it wrecks our relationship with Him. And that's the truth that He came with. And here's the reality, is the truth can often hurt. The fact that you're a sinner in need of being saved by grace doesn't sound great, but he comes in with the truth anyways. Why? Because he loves you enough to tell you the truth. You see, people that don't love you lie to you. People that love you tell you the truth, even when it hurts. 
But here's the amazing part about Jesus being the true light of the world. That he, is he didn't just come in the world with truth. He didn't just come into the world to say, hey, you're a sinner. Hey, you've fallen short. Hey, you haven't done everything right. Hey, you've thought the wrong thing sometimes. You've said the wrong thing sometimes. You've done the wrong thing sometimes. No, he didn't just come to share truth, although he did that. He came in grace and truth. And what is grace? Grace is God's free gift of love and forgiveness in your life. Grace is the fact that although you deserve wrath, although you deserve hell, although you deserve separation from God, what He gives you is love. What He gives you is forgiveness. Because when He was on the cross, Jesus was born in the manger. Why? Not just so that He could be an example for our lives, although Jesus is a great example. Jesus wasn't born in the manger so that He could teach us, although He is a great teacher. Jesus was born in the manger so that he could die in your place for your sins on the cross. And when he was dying in your place for your sins on the cross, what that means is if you believe in what he's done for you and his death for you on the cross and in his resurrection, what that means is that by his grace, he freely gives you love and forgiveness and that you are forgiven and free forever, period. Grace and truth. The truth can be hard to hear. The grace is beautiful to receive. But here's the thing, you can never receive the grace if you don't receive the truth. Because if you don't realize you're a sinner, you're never going to want to receive forgiveness. If you don't realize the truth, you will never receive the grace. I remember my uh, pastor growing up, Pastor Steve Madsen, uh, he would often speak on this idea of, of grace and truth. And uh, he would often liken this quality of God, both full of grace and truth, to bacon-wrapped asparagus. And he'd say, you know, the truth, it's like asparagus. It's good for you, uh, but a lot of us, we don't like the taste of it, and uh, we don't like the smell of it, but we need it. But here's the thing, the, the truth by itself, we wouldn't really want that. But when you wrap that thing in bacon, man, it's a whole lot easier to go down. Meaning, yeah, it might be hard to confront your sin. Yeah, it might be hard to confront the fact that you need God to save you and you can't save yourself. Yeah, that might be hard to do. But when you realize that God's grace is in your life and that despite all of your wrongs, He wants to love you and forgive you and draw you back to Him, that will help you swallow the truth. Now, the problem is, is most people think of God as only all grace or they think of God as only all truth. The people that think God is only all, all grace, they liken God to a big teddy bear. And God is this cute little, little teddy bear that just, you know, you can hold and, you know, he holds you back and he's warm and he's cuddly and he only says nice things to you. And Jesus is just meek and mild and he never says anything hard. He never, ever, 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 ever says anything that uh, is, will confront you and confront your sin and call you out and make you feel uncomfortable. And some people, they think God is just all grace. But other people, they think God is just all truth. And so instead of being a warm teddy bear, God is all truth. So God is this legalistic teacher that is constantly telling you what to do. And whenever you don't do what he tells you to do, he fails you, he alienates you, and he looks down on you, and he's legalistic. But God is neither all truth or all grace. He's both at the same time. This is who God really is. In Jesus he comes full of grace and truth, and he reveals the heart of God. And what is the heart of God? The heart of God towards you is the heart of a father. He's a loving father that looks at his child and has no problem telling his child what they did wrong and how they can improve and what needs to change. But while they tell their child what they did was wrong, at the same time, they look at them in the eye and they bring him in for a hug and say, I still love you anyways, and I'm here for you. That's the heart of God. That's what Jesus shows us. He's full of grace and full of truth. And that's how he was the light in the world. And who is this light for? He says it. He says the true light was coming into the world to give light to who? Everyone. Jesus did not come to give light to only a few people. Jesus came to give light to everyone on earth, which means he came to give light to you. He came to share truth with you. He came to share grace with you. He loves you. Christmas is about Him pursuing you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. 
He wants to give you the grace. He wants to give you the truth. The question is, is will you receive it? Because here's the truth, is there are many people that do not receive it, which actually brings me to my second point that I want to share with you. Now here's the second point on what it means for Jesus to be the true light, and it's this, is that the true light is not recognized by everyone. I wish that every single person in this world would recognize Jesus as the true light. And if you do not yet know what it means for Jesus to be the true light in your life, I would hope that you would know that by the end of our time together today. But here's the reality is that not everybody recognizes Jesus as the true light. It's exactly what the 10th verse in John chapter 1 says. When it says this, it says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Now, when Jesus was born in a manger thousands of years ago, it was unlike any other birth in human history. And it was unlike any other birth, not only because he was born in a manger, which was a feeding trough for animals, which, you know, isn't a very common thing now. It wasn't just uncommon for that reason. It was uncommon because when Jesus was born, he was taking on human flesh. And in that moment, and for the rest of his life here on earth, he would be both fully God and fully man. He took on human flesh so that we could identify with him. He was tempted just as we are tempted. He was hungry just as we are hungry. He was thirsty just as we get thirsty. He did it to identify with us. That's why he took on the human flesh. But even more than that, he did it so that he could be the perfect sacrifice and substitute for our sins on the cross. But not only was he fully human, he was fully God. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verse 10, that though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. That the Creator was literally, in Jesus Christ, walking around its creation. And the creation did not recognize its Creator. And there are many of you that are creations of God that you do not yet recognize Jesus as your Creator And he was, and he is, and he forever will be. Now, many people will say this, and maybe this describes you if you're a little skeptical of Christianity. Many people say this, well, I could never believe in God, and I could never, you know, get religious, I could never follow Jesus, I could never become a Christian, mainly for one reason, and the reason is this, is I've never seen God. I've never seen God, and I've never seen him in in the flesh, so how can I recognize him as God if I've never seen God? Well, here's what you need to know, is it's actually kind of more logical to think that the Creator would not necessarily always be at all times within or around its creation. Think of it like this, one of my favorite stories of all time, Lord of the Rings, written by Tolkien. Frodo doesn't know who Tolkien is. Why? Because Frodo is a character that Tolkien made up. And he made him up, and he made up the whole story, right? He wrote Aragon, Legolas, Gimli, Gandalf, all those characters. He wrote that amazing story that was turned into movies, some of my favorite movies ever. But Frodo doesn't know who Tolkien is. Frodo doesn't know who Tolkien is because why? Tolkien's not in the story. He's the creator of the stories, and so his creatures do not know him. The only way that Frodo and all the rest of the characters would ever know who Tolkien is, is if Tolkien wrote himself into the story. If he himself, with his own hand, wrote himself as a character in the story so that his other characters could meet him. And don't you know that's exactly what God has done for us in Jesus Christ? Don't you know that's the very meaning of Christmas? Don't you know that's why Jesus was the true light of the world? That he was literally God in flesh, human flesh. God wrote himself into the story. God could have created the world. He could have created you and me, and he could have just left us in the dark and had nothing to do with us. But he didn't do that. In love, he wrote himself into the story. In love. The Word became flesh, John chapter 1, verse 14 says, and dwelled among us. He wrote himself in the story, which means that if you know Jesus, if you see Jesus, if you see Jesus for who he really is, and you study Jesus, and you read the Gospels, and if you haven't read any of the Gospels yet, which there are four Gospels in the Bible, 
And what they are is they're all books in the Bible, all four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they tell the story of Jesus. If you've never read one of those all the way through, I want to challenge you to do that. I want to challenge you to maybe just start with the Gospel of John, which is the Gospel that we're starting right now in the first chapter. But here's what you need to know. When you study Jesus, when you look at Jesus, you're literally seeing the Creator. You're literally seeing fully God, fully human, God writing themselves in the story. Why? So that you could know Him. And the problem is, though, is that there are many people that they don't believe in Jesus and they don't recognize Jesus as the true light and they don't recognize Jesus as God. And the reasoning kind of goes along the lines of this. Well, yeah, I believe Jesus was a real person. And, uh, you know, I believe he was famous and, you know, influential. But to me, you know, when I look at him, I only see him as a teacher. And many people, they don't place Jesus as Lord in their life. They don't follow him as God in their life because they just see him as a normal religious teacher. No more and not much different than, you know, Buddha, Muhammad, or Joseph Smith, or any other religious leader that you can think of or name. But you see, you can't do that. Because when you actually read the Gospels that record the life of Jesus, when you actually look and listen and see Jesus for what he really said and what he really claimed and what he really did, you cannot, under any circumstances, think that he was just a teacher. C.S. Lewis famously said that you either have to look at Jesus as a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. But you can't look at him as a teacher because he doesn't leave room for that. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Okay, when you look at the life of Jesus, this is what you see. You see a person healing the lame. You see a person healing the leper. You see a person healing handicapped. You see a person doing all kinds of miracles. And not only do you see that, you see a person that is worshipped by other people and he's not stopping the worship. He's not telling them, I'm just a human, don't worship me. No, he's letting people worship him. And not only that, he did the greatest miracle. He rose from the dead three days later after his crucifixion. Now, if you had uh, one of your teachers when you were in high school, and you're in you know math class with this teacher, and this teacher claims to be God, and they write it on the whiteboard, right? They write it on the, the chalkboard. They say, I am God. Worship me. Well, what would you think of that teacher? You would think that they are a liar, right? They are lying to you. They are selling you lies. Or you would think they're lunatic. You're like, oh my gosh. Uh, our class has been so misbehaving and so bad for so long, they've gone crazy. They're a lunatic. Or you could say that they're Lord, and the teacher actually was God. Now, in that case, they wouldn't be God. They would either be a liar or a lunatic, because they're just a normal human being. They're just a normal teacher. They truly are just a teacher. But when you look at the life of Jesus, you don't see a normal teacher. You don't see a normal person that's teaching religious principles. You see somebody speaking on authority. He said, before Abraham was, I am. People killed him. Why was Jesus killed? Because he was a religious teacher. No, he was killed because he claimed to be God. And the religious leaders didn't like that. They didn't believe that. They believed he was a blasphemer. What is blasphemy? It's when you claim to be God. He was claiming to be God and he wasn't God. He was claiming to be something that they didn't think he was, and they killed him for it. But he proved them wrong by raising back from the dead three days later. And so when you actually look at the life of Jesus, first of all, don't even make a comment about Jesus if you haven't actually read the Gospels. Read a Gospel if you don't yet know Jesus, if you haven't yet recognized him as Lord. Read it. Ask him to speak to you, and I guarantee you when you look at it, You cannot just see him as a teacher. And so you have to decide for yourself, is this a lie? Is he a lunatic or was he a lunatic or is he actually Lord? And if he is Lord, it means that you must recognize him. You have to worship him. You have to give him your life. And you have to realize that it's a joy to give him your life because he's full of grace and truth. Now here's the third and final point I want to share with you on what it means for Jesus to be the true light of the world. And it's this, is that the true light shines to bring you into his family. The true light shines to bring you into his family. John chapter 1 verse 12, it says this, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Why did Jesus shine into this world? Why did Jesus leave heaven and come to earth? 
Why was he born? Why did he die? Why was he resurrected so that you could be in his family? Notice verse 12. It says that to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The right to become. I want to look at that word become. What does it mean to become children of God? Well, first it means that none of us are born children of God. The Bible actually teaches that we're all spiritual orphans in need of being saved from our sin because we're separated from God. People often say, well, we're all children of God. Every creature, every man, every woman, every person on this world is a child of God. And that's just not true. It's not true. The reality is is that we are all born spiritual orphans because we are born into a sinful world. We are sinners by nature, but we are also sinners by choice. But here's the good news is God didn't want to stay separate from you. Here's the good news. God didn't want you to stay as a spiritual orphan. Here's the good news. God wants you to be in his family because he loves you and created you for himself and to have a relationship with you. And so how is the relationship restored? How do you receive forgiveness? By simply believing in Jesus Christ. It says, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You do not need to force your way into God's family through good works. Most people think that's how it works. Most people think I have to force my way into God's family. If I need God to love me, if I need God to accept me, if I need God to forgive me, then my good works need to outweigh my bad. And I need to be a good enough person. I need to attend attend church enough. I need to act a certain way. I need to talk a certain way. I need to dress a certain way. And if I do those good things, then my good works will force me into his family. That's not what he's saying here. You become a part of God's family by the free gift of God's forgiveness in your life when you place your faith in him, when you believe in him, when you stop trying to save yourself and you realize you can't and you just say, Jesus, I invite you to do what I could never do for myself. But here's the thing, is although that free gift of love and forgiveness, although that free gift of you being in his family is available to you, he will not force it on you. God will not force you into his family. God will not force you to believe in him. God will not force you to place your faith in him. Think of it like this. When it comes to adoption, and I'm talking about adopting children and and teenagers now. When it comes to adoption, the adoption rate for infants is far higher than the adoption rate for teenagers. Why? Well, the truth is, is infants are cuter and they tend to be more of a blank slate and so they can be a little bit easier to adopt. When you adopt a teenager, it's a little bit harder. They already have experiences. They're probably more wounded. Uh, There's probably more work to do. There's more trust to earn. And so what often happens is is people tend to adopt infants but not adopt teenagers. Now, most states require for anybody over the age of 14 to 18 that's up for adoption that not only do the parents have to choose to adopt them, but they have to consent to the adoption. Infants don't have any consent. So whoever chooses to adopt them, if they're you know, authorized to adopt, they adopt the infant. But once a child grows to being 14 years or older in most states, they have to consent to the adoption. Now here's what the gospel is. The gospel means that God adopted you not when it was most convenient, not when you were most cute, but when you already had all the sin, when you already had all the junk. The Bible says that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. While you were at your worst, God loved you. But here's the amazing part. Although he offers to adopt you into his family, he is not going to force you into his family. He gives you the choice whether or not you will place your faith in him or not. So my question is to you, what do you do with Jesus? What have you done with Jesus? Have you placed your faith in him? Have you realized he's the true light of the world? Are you in God's family? Here's my invitation to you today as we close. It's this, is that today you can turn to the true light and trust in Jesus. No matter who you are, no matter where you're at in your journey, today you can turn to the true light and trust in him. You see, every morning the sun rises and the light shines all day, but during the night the sun sets to not be seen again until it rises again. 
Listen, God's light is shining on you today. His love is extended to you today. His grace is extended to you today. His mercy is extended to you today. But one day it will set. One day your life will be over. One day you will die and you will see God face to face. And his question that he will ask you is this, what did you do with Jesus? Did you recognize him as the true light of the world? Did you receive his light into your life? Did you receive his love into your life? Did you place your faith in him and trust in him and as a result be a part of my family? Or did you turn away? Today is your opportunity to turn to the true light and trust in him. God's question to you when you see him face to face after you die will not be, were you successful? Were you rich? Were you better than most people? No, his question will be, did you turn and trust in the true light that is Jesus? Let's all turn to that true light today as we remember the true story of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas. God leaving heaven, being born as a baby here on earth, ultimately so that he can grow up, die the death that we deserve, and rise again three days later to new life so that if we place our faith in him, we can have a new life too. Let's pray. And before I pray in just a moment, I just want to say this. If you're watching this and you've you've never received the love of Jesus in your life, you've never turned to the true light and trusted in him and placed your faith in Jesus, you don't know what it's like to be in the family of God, and you want to do that today. In this Christmas season, in this crazy year that's 2020, you want to place your faith in Jesus and know what it's like to be in his family. Say this prayer with me. And if you're already in the family of God, you can pray this prayer as well as a way of just saying, God, I give you my life again. But pray this prayer for the first time if that's you and God was speaking to you today. You could pray something like this. God, thank you for coming into this world thousands of years ago to save me. Thank you for being the true light. Thank you for dying for my sins on the cross. Thank you for rising again. Today I recognize you as the true light of the world. Today I'm placing my faith in you. I'm trusting in you. Thank you for letting me be in your family. From this day forward, I ask that all of my life would be in your hands. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, you made it to the very end of our online Christmas service. Thanks so much for joining us. I really do hope that this time helped you know the love of Jesus in a more personal way so that then you can go and show it out to others. If at the end of my message you decided to pray with me and that was the very first time you ever prayed to ask Jesus into your life and to follow him, or maybe it was a really significant moment for you of rededicating your life to him, could you please let me know that? I would love to just hear from you. And most importantly, I would really love to help you grow in your new journey that you've just started with Jesus. So go ahead, email me at josh at easthillschurch.com. I'm going to have my email down in the description below so you can have it there. But also, before you head out, I just want to say this. As it's ending the end of the year and we're about to go into the new year of 2021, if you would like to give to the mission of our church, East Hills Church, so the mission can continue to move forward, you can give online on our website. The link is below. I know it's ending the year. So if you have any end of the year gifts that you would like to give to our church, uh, that would be much appreciated. I really do believe that uh, we are going to see God do amazing things in our church in this new year of 2021. And so your money will be going to the right place because I really, really do believe that we're going to see him do amazing things in your resources that God gives you allows us to continue for that mission to move forward. Uh, so thanks so much for considering that. And thank you even more for just being a part of our service today. Again, I love you all so much. We meet every Sunday at the tent right now at 11 a.m. And also, obviously, online, either on Facebook or YouTube. So we'll see you next time at 11 a.m. at any of those locations, online or in person. We'll see you next time.